Good morning, and welcome to the Sika Cast. It's 2020. Where are claims in the collision repair market heading? I'm Ed Weidman, Executive Director of Sika. Today's webinar is being presented by Sean Carey. Sean has more than 30 years of experience in the automotive industry. A mechanical engineer by trade, he worked at one of the largest parts distribution companies in the United Kingdom. He then joined Nissan at its London headquarters where he created and managed its certified collision repair program. After moving to the United States in 1995, Kerry established Carter & Carter International and then joined Fix Auto where he was jointly responsible for the spinoff of Syncast, an automotive claims and collision repair IT company. In 2009, Sean established S. CG Management Consultants, LLC. Since then, he has consulted with all sectors of the automotive claims industry. Over the past five years, he has become a regular speaker at industry conferences on the subjects of telematics and the potential impact it will have on the claims in the collision market. As we start the webinar, I want to remind you that there is no verbal communication between the participants and the presenters. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them in the webinar navigation pane on your screen. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. And now, I'll turn the program over to Sean. Well, thank you very much, Ed. Good morning or afternoon, I guess, if you're on the East Coast, to, to those that are joining. I appreciate you giving an hour of your time to uh, my presentation today. Uh, thanks, Sika, for inviting me to do this and kick the year off. Hopefully, some of the information is helpful as you go through 2020 and beyond. Um, and in particular, thanks to Ed and Stacy uh, for helping to, to hold my hand through through this little process. Um, oh, let me go previous, just one second. There we go. Just getting used to the slide, Jaden. Um, although Ed introduced me, I just wanted to bring up this slide very quickly. It, it kind of says I'm an engineer by trade, uh, I'm a marketeer by profession, and a strategist by occupation. It sounds grandiose. Uh, I'm a one-man band consulting guy out of Chicago. But I'm very fortunate I get to travel to the halls and walls of the claims and collision repair industry across most of the segments, in fact, probably all of the segments. And I get to you the opportunity to have a look at where an industry is going, where the segments inside that industry are going, where the constituent companies are going, uh, and where they need to be positioned uh, for success in the future. What this bio sheet doesn't tell you is that <clears throat> at the back end of 2019, uh, I took a huge step. I've been here for 25 years, and I became an American citizen. I'm very proud of that. And so, for the first public presentation as an American, I'm happy to say, my fellow Americans, it's 2020, where are claims and the collision repair market heading? What we're about to go through is one man's perspective of that. I start most of my presentations, if not all, by saying, this is one man's opinion. I represent a lot of companies in the industry, um, and some of them share my opinions, some of them don't share my opinions, but in all of my public presentations, this is just one man's opinion of where I think an industry is going. We'll take a look at this in three segments today. Uh, before we look forward, let's take a little look back, and it's a little bit self-gratifying, but we'll do that. We'll take a look at the prevailing conditions as we enter this new decade, which will see the most rapid and radical change that our industry has ever known. And then at the, uh, the final, I'll, I'll try and take a look at what that means for the various constituents as we exit 2020 and head towards 2021 and beyond. Um, so let's take a look back. If you like, let's do a little bit of revision. Um, those of you that have been in and around my presentations or have pulled any of my information up online will have seen this slide, which I've used for any number of years now. <coughs> It is, in fact, close to five years old. And it's a slide that, that I uh, created uh, after the launch of my Pricelink. And having witnessed how an industry was absolutely shocked and completely dismayed that an OEM would have 
the intrusion to create a strategic position in a marketplace that was different to what was current in the marketplace absolutely set me back. So I took a look at the industry and thought, wow, the OEMs are going to have a stakeholding here in our little game that we call claims and collision repair. Um, and yet an entire industry was not ready, nor prepared, nor in many cases interested in the OEMs getting into the business. So I decided that I'd pull this slide together. It says, how will the OEMs return to the market? Um, they'll start with parts programs. It's the pointy end of the stick. It's what they do best. It's what they do first. Um, but it won't be the parts programs of old. I mean, we've got price matching, we've got MPL, we've got parts relationships, but it will be supplemented by industry support. And what we've seen over the past couple of years is the OEMs really stepping up and providing position statements, technical and technological resources, information, and at the same time building out their consumer networks. I think it would be hard for anybody on this call who's in touch with the claims and collision industry to say, that the OEMs support their programs and their networks aren't having quite an impact on the market as we go forward. I then went on to say that they'll start to establish relationships and partnerships with industry constituents. I always refer to Chris Mayer from General Motors who said, we'll, we'll choose our partners wisely. Um, there won't be room to work with all. And they are in the process now very much of choosing their partnerships. At the same time, the OEM stakeholders will change. Uh, again, this is a five-year-old slide, and it was saying that uh, we used to get the parts guy, and God bless them, they're good guys, and you and I probably know most of them. Um, but the OEMs are becoming far more sophisticated, and the stakeholders are changing. When I go and visit with my OEM friends now, I, I'm equally as likely to end up in conversations with the data team or the first notice of loss team or the analytics team or the connected car team. And once they do that, the assets that the OEM bring to the market begin to change and they're able to deploy these assets. So we are going through that phase that has just popped up in the orange colored box there. And I believe we'll get through that within the next two to three years. And once we're through that, anything's possible in this brave new world. Another slide I've used is what if the car made the claim? I put this up on stage in Barcelona in 2004. 15 or 16, and it said, I think the vehicle's capable of making a claim. It was a little far-fetched back then, but I said, the data from the cars will come up to a center, and then those that have a use for that information will be able to do and take from it what is necessary to create a more efficient market. And very clearly back then, uh, I wouldn't have put this up if I didn't think it was possible or I didn't think it was actually happening. What I can tell you for sure now is that with all of the OEMs, this is available. They have the ability to connect into that vehicle in real time to dispatch emergency vehicles, to begin the process of starting a, an insurance claim, and an FNOL as we know it, a first notice of incident as they would know it. The sophistication of how they are able to assess the vehicle in terms of damages and parts that aren't working is far more sophisticated than it was back in those days. And they are beginning the process of reaching into the market to find out what to do with that information. This is the third slide of revision. It's one I created in 17, but I've moved it on. Um, I think I said in 2018, we'll see the OEMs more active in the market. Well, I think that's pretty much done and dusted. I said in 19, we'll start to see the evolution of capability networks where we become far more consumer focused. We behave doing the right things. The conversation shifts to doing the right things. That will change the allegiance for money in terms of positioning. And the relationships that are fostered will, will provide or not provide access to critical information. I believe we're there. As we look at 2020, what I've predicted there is that we'll see in, insurers adjusting their adjustment model will change, and it is changing quite rapidly. We'll begin to see the onset of vehicle information packs, instant metrics, and over-the-air updates for consumers. I think we're right on track. Uh, again, it's a little self-serving. Look how brilliant I was way back when. Um, but I think just to set the essence for the call today, as I talk about where I think 2020 will go and where 2021 will go, it's important to look back and say, I do have 
some insight into where the market is. All right, so what are the prevailing conditions as we enter this new decade? I don't know where I lifted this slide from, but I lifted it. It's not mine. I don't take credit for it, but it's a slide that I use to open most presentations. Cars, the gift that just keeps on giving. We are all on this call. We are probably all employed, and we are certainly in this economic uh, mega trough called the, because of the vehicle. From the moment it is conceived in the 12 class floors of the, the, the design studios of OEMs through its life in prototype, pre-production, production, sales and distribution, servicing parts, maintenance and collision repair until every last ounce of metal, plastic and fluid is squeezed out of it. It is an economic lifeblood for all of us and we are in the business because of the car. And yet we've disrespected the car significantly for the past 10 years. In our claims and collision repair business, we have disrespected that vehicle. We are not giving it the credence it deserves, and we're not giving the customers that drive it the repairs and the functionality and the service that they should have. That's a cold hard fact. So let's take a look at this. The OEM market, in terms of its demographics, is enormous. As I said, the car is the gift that keeps on giving. It gives $600 billion worth of new car sales revenue to the OEMs and dealerships. It's got $1.2 trillion worth of outstanding loans against 108 million vehicles that are financed. Dealerships alone repair $116 billion worth of cars, and 315 million repair orders, and it's a 300 billion used car market just at the dealers. Of the 40 million used vehicles annually, um, 300 billion of that is coming from directly from the dealers. It is a mega business. It is huge. Um, when we turn to the insurer business, just to put it into size and scale, um, last year the, the the fact book is out now. The 2019 information. It was 246 billion dollars worth of private passenger auto, around 205 million vehicles insured. Although no one's ever quite sure of that because there's a couple of states, fairly sizable states, that don't necessarily port the same as everybody else. Oh, I've just lost my slide deck. Anybody else lose their slide deck? Oh, there we go. Um, when we look at uh, Property and casualty, and again, the private passenger auto segment of that, 148 billion worth of liability and 98 billion worth of collision and comprehensive. What's interesting to me, though, is that there's $180 billion worth of losses, of which only 153 billion are paid claim losses, which means there's $26 billion of loss of just expense. I'll come back to that in a few moments, but it is an extortionate amount of money. It is an enormous amount of money from a demographic of the U.S. claims market that clearly is driving the change in how claims will be settled going forward. Now we're not playing ball. There we go. So let's move to the prevailing conditions. Oh, hang on. These slides are playing up just a little. Let's take a look at the repairer demographic market. I believe it's about a $39 billion of total invoices um, through the industry. But some will say a bit more, some will say less. I do a lot of extrapolation off different numbers. Uh, 39, 40 billion, it's around that size of market. I think there's 27,000 active repair shops. Um, and by that, I have filtered out a great deal of those that are, are not what I would consider to be active repair shops. I think of the 27,000, there's possibly 15,000 of true class A professional shops. And of them, there's probably only eight to 10,000 at the max that have all of the equipment, the training, and the necessary skills to repair today's vehicles. And that's going to get tougher. There's 300, uh, 13 million repairs annually, shoot me for a, a couple of hundred thousand either side, and the average repair is, I put it at 32.50, it's 3,500 if you, uh, in Susanna's publication at CCC, it's 33 or something, I think, with Mitchell. But as I talk to shops and extrapolate the numbers out, nobody seems to have an average ticket of 3,500. We're gonna get there, 
by the way, this is going to go up to 5,500, 6,500, um, and that's going to go up fairly rapidly in the next two years, but we'll get to the future in a, in a few minutes. So what I've done with the prevailing conditions of the market is I've used the same headings across the top of each page, so closer to the customer, accountable for the full experience, in order to try and give a sense of what the meaning is to each of the constituents. And again, I've focused here today on the OEMs, the insurers, and the repair shops. Um, I understand there are, there are a lot a lot of other constituents and influences in the market. But if we take a look at the OEM and their prevailing conditions of closer to the customer, connectivity has created this direct customer relationship in collision repair. Uh, it, it's an opportunity that they've never had before. And so they are going to get closer to the collision repair customers, which then creates a more full accountability for that experience. Right now, they're accountable for the vehicle, its performance, how it does on the road, what its functionality is. Um, I think as they get into the claims and collision repair business a bit more directly, they'll now have uh, accountability for the outcome of a collision event. And that's a differentiator from where we've been traditionally. It means that new, new expertise is required. And invariably, then, this day and age, that means technology. And so software, applications, data transfer, others, um, they are leaning on those that would serve an industry, telematic service providers, uh, cloud-based organizations that bring services. You need only open the web every day to see that company A has partnered with company B. It will bring them significant new opportunities. This is a rich and fertile ground potential for the OEMs. Um, what's coming into focus for them is repair directives. They are going to be able to send vehicles to shops right off the app or the networks or whatever. But they have to grow that network out and they have to get more involved in the first notice of loss. But clearly they're doing that. And first notice of loss is sometimes referred to as the battle of first notice of loss. I don't think the OEMs necessarily see it as that. I think they see it as first ind indication that their customers need their help and they can step in to help them. But nonetheless, they'll get into the tow, the glass, the rental, the total loss recovery and replacement. So the OEMs have a lot of opportunities here, but what are their objectives? Mike Anderson always says, first and foremost, it's a safe and proper repair. And I would absolutely and wholeheartedly agree with that. It's also capturing through the scanning and diagnostic that's now being done under an unperformed maintenance work that may drive dealer sales. You may find yourself referring parts of the vehicle that weren't damaged or uh, uh, a change or, or a service needed on the vehicle that wasn't a direct relation to the impact or the, or the crash event, but now creates a business opportunity for them. So they're always going to be looking to drive sales. I think it provides a terrific opportunity for the OEMs to get closer to their re residual values. Part sales will follow if they get this right and vertical relationships. So they will have relationships with insurers and information technology companies. Uh, and new companies that will enter the business. But that is their prevailing conditions. When we turn to the insurers, again, the same heading is just slightly different. Uh, you know, connectivity creates a direct customer relationship. I think they've kind of had that, but what they're now reaching into, either with OEMs in partnership or through third, third party providers, um, is information directly from the car. So whether it be through a dongle or through a phone or through whatever mechanism they're, they're bringing to marketplace, um, they're going to see opportunities that didn't exist. They're going to be able to identify immediate mitigation and fraud resolution or potential fraud resolution, I think you should probably call it. And just as importantly for them, method of inspection, that's what MOI stands for, is method of inspection. But they will take it more accountability for the experience than they have been doing. Claims for me is the touch point for the insurance community. And yet what has happened over the past 10 years is it's become a cost control. Um, and managing claims has become so very expensive that they're going to introduce new claims models. Um, they're going to, to start introducing digital imaging and self-reporting and touchless claims and artificial tech, um, augmented reality and all those sorts of things. Um, and it's a possibility that it might have an effect in the time frame we're looking at. But reality is, I think it will turn into a bit of a nightmare for everybody in the first instance. They too are getting far more technical. 
They are, when we look at the new expertise that's required, they are making partnerships and, and entering into partnerships with technology companies left, right, and center. Um, some of them on claims, some of them just on underwriting, but they are introducing themselves and becoming more familiar. Uh, there's a whole ecosystem called InsurerTech, which I have several opinions on that I'll get to a bit later. They do have new and they do have new opportunities in underwriting. They are going to be either forced to or jump head first into user-based insurance, pay as you drive, pay how you drive, pay when you drive. The new claims dynamic will, will inevitably give them an opportunity to seek reduction in force, particularly with claims adjuster and temporized claim staff management. Um, they will get far greater fidelity on first notice of loss, but they will begin the process through this technical advancement of outsourcing many elements of the claims system. When I first stood on stage three years ago and said, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna lose claims adjusters as we know it, people looked at me like we've got three here, and lo and behold, we're starting to see the onset of it. But what are their objectives? I see safe and proper repair as their objective. I genuinely believe in my heart that there isn't one insurer that doesn't want a safe and proper repair. They want to be better informed. They understand that they have been less well informed as they should be. Underwriting really is a hundred old, hundred year old model that's changing dramatically and needs to change dramatically. You know, whether you're writing insurance as a result of my zip code or my gender or my income level is nowhere near as accurate as it could be or needs to be. They're going to have to reduce loss of just expense. It is beyond control now and they will obviously look to increase customer satisfaction and retain customers in the brand. And the reason why the brand was highlighted in red for both the OEMs and the insurers is that brand defection is a very expensive business for these guys. These are large mega corporations and 41% of all drivers that have a claim, have an accident, no matter how effectively it was handled, will seek to change their insurance company while at the same time, 30, 36% of people that drive their cars will change their manufacturer or brand within 12 months of a not properly handled claim. Um, sources differentiate there, but it's, it's kind of playing out as fairly true. The cost of failure is a very common energy and brand defection is crippling for these individual organizations. But equally, uh, as a constituent in the marketplace, we're just not doing a good job of looking after the customer. What does it cost? I know the OEM market really well, uh, and so I, I, I'm able to dive in and do a little bit more sort of uh, inspection here. Uh, I estimate that 11 million customers that are driving a brand vehicle walk out of a collision repair shop every year, and the OEM has no idea what has happened to that. There's an argument that could say they don't have an idea what happens to the 13% that are repaired in certified shops. But they are going to get much closer to it. It's customers exposed that needn't necessarily be exposed. We all know the parts argument. It's not quite sunset, but it's getting there. It's a four and a half billion dollar opportunity to start to reconvert some of those aftermarket parts and uh, salvage parts back to OEM. $66 billion worth of under and unperformed work on the roads and $160 billion is the net result of that 36% switch out. The numbers as you get closer to the vehicle become significantly higher. And whereas the OEMs weren't paying a great deal of attention to collision repair up until about three or four years ago, they certainly are now. When it comes to the insurers and the impact on that, I have to look at it slightly differently because, I, as I say, I'm not as well educated on the insurer's business market uh, as I am on the OEMs. But here's what I do know what brand affection is costing them. They spend $8 billion annually attracting customers. Some of the insurers spend in excess of a $1 billion just advertising their product when they already have a fairly healthy and grown market share. Their loss adjustment expense is $7.5 billion for private passenger auto. It's an extrapolated number, but basically of the 26 billion that you saw, 39% of it is directly related. It's all private passenger auto. 39% of it's directly related um, to collision and, and comp. And so if you average that out at $575 per repair, now before the insurers start shouting at me and sending in uh, emails or whatever it is, I get it. There's total losses. There's non-repaired. There's a lot of work that goes into that. 
But even so, $7.5 billion of loss adjusted expense on private passenger auto seems to me to be way too much. And the evidence of that is as we look at the consumer price index, and this is you know, right off the, the pages of the insurance fat book for 2020. The private passenger auto consumer price index is 58.5%, whereas new cars are at 7.9, used cars are at 9, body work as defined in that uh, document is 21.8, and overall it's 17. Something is way out of kilter. And yet, if we look to the bottom right, I think the costs are set to increase further. I think repairs are going to go up. The average repair is going to go up significantly. Uh, it seems fairly obvious to me as we get more sophisticated cars that require longer and, and more uh, in, in, uh, more detailed repairs, we're going to see rental increase and the employee costs that they're facing will increase as well. And so, whereas brand deflection, I haven't referred it directly back to the numbers that they sell, they're the cost of brand defection to them is that these are the, this is the money they have to spend in order just to stand still. And whereas some are growing and some aren't, uh, it is out of kilter with reality. If the overall CPI is 17% and private passenger orders at 58.5, something isn't right. Let's go back to these prevailing conditions and I'll finish up with the repairers here. Closer to the customer. If, any, if you're any closer to the customer, you'd be the customer. Well, let's hang on a minute here, folks. You are, you're a proxy of the customer. And as such, in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of good men everywhere, you should advocate for that customer. And I don't know that we've always advocated for the customer on an individual basis uh, for a little while. From the moment you take control of the vehicle, you are accountable. You're accountable and being held accountable for customer contact, repair quality, the performance and appearance of the vehicle, for cost control, for customer satisfaction. As for keeping up with new expertise, thank God you're not in the insurer tech or the fintech world, but you do have to keep up with the diagnostics, the calibration, procedures, parts, equipment, estimating, ADAS, on and on and on. And what new opportunities is this presenting for you guys? Well, just think about that. It depends on where you focus. I'll get to that when I come to my second to last slide for you. But your strategic business objectives remain pretty much aligned. Safe and proper repair stands at the top of them. I don't think I know a shop that wouldn't put its hand on its heart and say, I try to deliver a safe and proper repair every time. You're gonna get called out in the future. You're going to get called out pretty loud and clearly because safe and proper repair requires you to do some things which we haven't all been doing for the longest time. You want to get paid for all the services you uh, perform. You want to stay on top of things. You want to look after the welfare of the business of the staff. And although it's a bit real grandiose, you, you are. There are significant repair organizations out there now that want to protect that customer and brand reputation. By significant repair organizations, I don't mean large MSOs, I mean companies that are doing it right, that put their brand on the line every day of the week. So I would say that for the past decade, we've kind of been getting the job done. It's kind of worked out. No one's really pulled back the covers of the claims and collision repair industry and truly identified the, uh, the circumstances under which a vehicle is involved in a crash and ultimately ends up being repaired and sent back to the customer. But this changes everything for me. For those of you that don't recognize this, uh, I'm not going to tell you what it is. You must have been buried in the sand for the past 18 months. But this changed everything as far as I'm concerned. And I say this not from an authoritative position. I simply say it from a human condition. Because from a jury perspective, the ordinary public they have said loudly and clearly that the maker of the auto is the expert on everything about the vehicle, including how it should be repaired. And if you read this statement closely from ASA, the Auto Alliance, and the global makers, and again, I've accredited each company with, uh, with who it was to publish this, it says they release a policy statement calling for all collision repairs to follow OEM procedures. They're not saying repairers, they're not saying the insurers, they're not saying the OEMs, they're saying all collision repairs to follow the OEM repair procedures. And so we have to wake up to this. This has to become a reality for us. And what does that mean 
for those of you on the call that have an interest in that. I'm going to try and put this together for you as best I can, uh, and we'll see where we go from there. If we look at those topics that I've identified, um, we're going to take five minutes to run through each of them, no enough. Um, but there are any number of topics. It is a wide breadbasket that is out there and should be out there. But we're going to look at the trade winds as I see it. So we've got some tailwinds, right? We have a few tailwinds that are, are, are helping the industry in the right direction. Uh, diagnostic, pre and post scans, they, they kind of are becoming the mainstream. I think I read somewhere where we're up to about 70 or 80 percent of shops performing them and insurers paying for them and then become. I can think back, if this was 12 months ago, we were in the fight, right? We were in that, that period of time when this was at 17 or 20%. And so we're starting to make some, some headway in terms of repairing the car in the right way. In terms of opportunities, scanning has the potential to uncover necessary operations. I'm not suggesting for one minute we try and perform operations as part of an insurance claim that weren't the result of the accident that occurred or the loss that occurred. But we might find out that this customer has got some other needs that, that should be addressed and that that will create either sublet or in-house or uh, passing on referring to dealer opportunities for many of the shops that care to take it up with calibration to, to follow. I think, I think we'll find far more. But it, we have a tailwind in that new processes and procedures are being willingly accepted. I think when we look at the crosswinds here, ADAS features has got the insurance community in a conundrum. First of all, they're reluctant. I mean, they genuinely are. They, they, they do a great service, right? I'm, I, for one, am glad I've got my insurance company. Um, and they're reluctant to refuse claims, legitimate claims on a requirement, should it be you know, related to safety or ADAS on a car. Um, but they're not quite there in terms of everything and all one is the same. And so the, what's happening is the parts content is, is a premium price. It's less exposed to the aftermarket uh, competition and the repairs are far more complex. And so, um, you know, there's an uncertainty there. There's a crosswind. I think we'll have to face it head on. I think we'll have to get to the end of it. But, uh, and I think that will happen within the next two years. I think certainly repair procedures uh, that focus on a safe and proper repair are being clearly heavily promoted by the OEMs. Uh, I'm not going to talk about instances or, or particular insurance commissions or insurance companies here. Um, but, you know, you've only got to look at the, the journals and see where up in the Northeast, despite the seemingly obvious imperative to repair the vehicle as per the recommendations, uh, insurers and insurance commissioners are using the full might of lobbying to refute that need. They're saying that it will increase premiums and be anti-competitive for those shops that can't repair to the proper procedures. I, I, it amuses me. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they can think that that's the right thing to say or do, but they are doing it, and they are very skilled in the lobbying areas, and the OEMs are going to face across windows. They, they try to challenge that. But nonetheless, repair procedures will become a very hot topic in the industry in 2020 and 2021. When I look at the headwinds, we've got connected vehicle and brand insurance, um, connected vehicles that impact on the claims and collision repair space. There'll be at least five, if not more, the top OEMs that release either some form of branded insurance or branded connected repair capability within the next 12 months. That, that's here, it's upon us. Um, and whereas it does provide the OEMs with an opportunity to have an influence on the repair criteria and, and what happens, um, it will also create a high degree of uncertainty um, and and probably suspicion by the insurance community as to where they're going with this and what they're doing. And while I see it as a threat, I think we're going to have some headwinds there. So where, where are these uh, constituents going to focus and, and what is the focus going to be? The shops, to me, it's very simple. You have to, in my opinion, one man's opinion, right? You have to become advocates for your customers' vehicles. Um, it will all turn to you. And rather than think about it as, you know, getting away from liability or, or not being held liable for these things. Just think about it as doing the right thing for your customer every single time. And if you do that, you'll be fine and dandy. 
um, prove that you're doing the right thing, validate those repairs. You have to prepare for beyond 2020. You are going to need the right people. They will be different people. You're going to need the right tooling. It will be different tooling and you're going to need the right information. And guess what? Yep, it's going to be different information. So you have to start preparing for that. I would urge all of you, the repairers that are listening, resist any temptation to claw black revenues. Now is not the time to go and stick it to them, so to speak. Now is the time to repair each vehicle safely and properly. And if you do that right, I believe there is a healthy profit margin to be had in the claims and in the collision repair business. The same hand if you're an OEM, now's the time to step up the market support. Make network certification aspirational, attainable, and affordable. Make people want to have it, make people be able to get it, and don't make it cost prohibitive to do it. Now is not the time to do that. I believe that the OEMs will and should seek some breakthrough relationships with the insurers or those representing the insurers, but I don't think it will come at the compromise of safe and proper repairs. And at the same time, as I often seem to be knocking the insurance community and some of the things, you know, I don't lose a moment to chastise my OEM friends when I talk about getting procedures and repair data into the market in easily digestible user experience, seek feedback on missing procedures, walk the talk. They're not all there. They're not all brilliant. Uh, so step up and walk the talk and get them into the marketplace and, and make sure they're complete. And I think if you do that as OEMs, part sales will follow. When I turn to the insurer, I expect a claims adjustment chaos for the next 12 or 24 months as carriers begin to exit claims management as we know it. I think InsureTech will be coming out of the wazoo. We'll see potential different solutions. There's a new one this morning that I read about. Potential different solutions from different carriers. They'll be testing, positioning, piloting, and implementing many underdeveloped self-managed claims tools. And as we exit 2020, I think we'll do so kicking and screaming as the insurers exit a 100-year-old process. Right now, as I observe it, and I go to you know, a lot of these conferences on connected insurance and connected auto insurance and da-da-da, I see the insurers trying to squeeze new technology into an old process rather than creating new processes through technology. Um, and I think once we get through that, we'll be fine, but they've got to go learn. There are for me three inevitabilities of an industry as we move forward into 2020. There is no question in my mind OEM procedures will dominate the headlines as shops embrace safe, complete, proper repairs. Has to be done, should be done. If you're not doing it, get on the train right now. I think claims management insurers will seed the space uh, to what they call AI, artificial intelligence. Um, I think they will bring in all sorts of different programs, you'll be taking pictures, your customers will be taking pictures, there'll be automated parts lists and repair doobie hoofers and it will be supplement hell for some time to come in my opinion. And finally, I think first notice of loss will begin to, to take effect in the industry. I think linked to the vehicle brand insurance and the connected car, we will begin to see the OEMs slowly but surely with confidence and with a high degree of certainty be able to direct their customers to shops that they have a high degree of confidence will look after a safe and proper repair and advocate for the customer. So where should repairers focus as we move through this brave new world? First and foremost, focus on your brand integrity and the customer experience. If you can't go to bed at night thinking you've sent every car out the door as a safe and proper repair, then you need to change that. You need to provide a consistent customer experience every single time, all the time. You need to prepare for nothing less than safe and proper repairs. And if I sound like a broken record, I make no apologies for it. It is time for us all to step up industry and, and begin the process of doing the right thing all the time. Not some of the time when it's being paid for, not other times when it's being paid by company A, not company B, all the time. In doing that, I think the repairers should reach out and think about the relationship with their dealers as certification and uh, calibration, diagnostics, uh, become more and more into the focus in 2020 and 2021. I think up to this point, we've seen dealers as parts vendors, we've seen them as sublet operators, we've seen them as a pain in the backside because they can't calibrate or diagnose a car any better than you can. Um, 
Think about reaching out to them in a different way. Think about understanding what is their motivation and what is your motivation. And I think you'll find that there is a happy marriage place in the middle of those two motivations and you could have a much better role uh, and an interface with them. Reduce your exposure. I don't mean get more insurance. Uh, I don't mean, you know, cook the books or, or do anything uh, that you shouldn't be doing. I mean, do the right thing. Do the right thing every time, validate it and document it, and you have no exposure. You are who you are, you repair cars. This is one that doesn't always please my OEM buddies uh, the best, but don't expect certified programs to deliver cars to the door. This is not. It hasn't set out to be a DR replacement. It should not be a DRP replacement. There is no doubt in my mind that if we're having this call in four or five years' time, the majority of your work might well be coming directly from the apps or the head units or the vehicle itself, and that will be directed by the OEMs. I, that, to me, is it's not a certainty, but it's pretty clear that it's going to happen. But don't see it as, a, as the sort of volumes and the sort of relationships that you have with your DRP programs right now. I think we will get, you know, people ask me, what's the return on investment of being certified? I think, well, it's going to make you a better shop. You're going to fit more parts. You're going to do more procedures and you're going to get paid for the things that you do. Um, and ultimately volume will come, but let's not swap out one for another. I think for a repairer, don't try and go it alone. I think you're beyond that. I think the large organizations are stepping up and are well equipped and well trained and well knowledgeable about where they're going to go in the marketplace. And, and I think as an independent repairer, or even as part of a franchise or an MSO, don't try and go it alone. Network and partner, reach out to support organizations, SICA, ICAR, you know, I know these organizations, CIC, try and take um, advantage uh, SCRS, others, uh, try and take advantage of all the things that they're looking at on your behalf. You may not agree with some of them. Some of them are political quagmires that you might have absolutely bones of contention with, but reach out and, and become part of the community because you're not going to be able to keep up with all of this on your own and repair cars and run a successful business. As a net result of that is, is your support mechanisms in the supply chain. There are many large organizations, obviously paint companies come to mind, right? Because they're always there at your side, willing to provide extra support. But look around your supply chain and understand where they have an influence in the marketplace and how they can support your efforts as you move forward. This is not gonna be easy, folks. This is gonna be a challenge, but it's one that we've gotta take on and we've gotta face. And finally, see your role as a critical touch point for the customer experience and the retention of the customer into all the brands. Remind the OEMs that you are retaining their customers for them. Remind the insurers you are retaining their customers for them. And most importantly, remind yourself that everything you do on behalf of that customer as an advocate of that customer will reflect on your future business going forward. Hey, listen, those of you that know me will know that I could talk for hours often without drawing back and that I certainly have an opinion on any and all of the things that we haven't even touched on today in any detail. Um, and I gladly do that on a one-to-one -one basis or wherever I happen to be in the marketplace. Uh, but for now, we're constrained by a certain time limit. Uh, I wanted to give 45 minutes to the presentation and allow 15 minutes for folks to ask questions if you have them. And so, and I thank you very much, and I hope that that has been helpful and informative. My email's at the bottom, should you care to have a question that we don't get to, I will do my very best to get back to you. Ed, back over to you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Um, let's see, uh, I'm gonna be asking Stacy, our Marketing Communication Director, have we received any uh, questions, Stacy? Yes, we have a couple. Uh, first, Sean, do you have any comments on what you believe the future will bring for DRP programs? Yeah, I don't see, I do have an opinion. Uh, I don't see radical changes to DRP programs um, over the, I, I've sort of phrased this or, or captured this over the next year or two. Um, I don't see radical changes to those. Um, I think that you will probably see the onset of certain DRP programs seeking for you to deploy certain technologies as a repairer that you probably don't or are not familiar with at this point in time. Um, but no, I, I think DRP continues to reside in its current format. 
um, for at least the next two years, yeah. Okay, thank you. And another question, uh, how will the validation of proper repair permeate the industry? Well, that, that is a very deep subject. I think it starts with a, a repair plan. Um, I think we've been trying to find a, an economic solution to an engineering problem for too long. Uh, I should have said that when I put you know, my slide up that says we've been doing okay for the past decade. We, we have been trying to force this economic solution into what has clearly become an engineering problem. Um, and as a result, we're going to have to do better in validating that every step that we should have taken has been taken, or at least understood and addressed. And in that respect, it, it can be as simple as, listen, let's not kid ourselves. Printing the repair procedures is not a repair plan, folks. It doesn't get the job done. It says we printed the repair procedures. We have to find mechanisms, and there'll be companies that enter the market or are in the market that will bring this to us, that absolutely become something of, you know, the 100-point checklist that this is what we did and this is how we did it. And we're going to have to get initials alongside it and settle for it. Now, the good news is I think that once we're through having come a, lot, come a long way along the scanning and diagnostic side and we'll come a long way on the calibration side. I think we'll come a long way on the procedure side and repair planning side. And I think it will become an operation that is billable the same as any other operation required to repair the vehicle properly and safely. So validation to me means doing more than just printing it out. If you're not printing it out, at least start there, I guess. Um, but checking the repair procedures, creating a repair plan, and then if you know, you follow the logic, only then would you really be able to write an estimate. Thank you for those recommendations. Another question we have is, what role do you see for the paint and supplies distrib distributor in the future? The paint and the supply distributor, distinct from the paint and supply company, um, I do see some differentiations. Uh, I think distribution as we know it, in the same way as the OEMs are exiting a 100-year business model, you know, they are all grasping how do we move from the combustion engines all through a dealer for a price to how do we address mobility into this, uh, this next decade. <clears throat> and every OEM is addressing that in the same way as insurers are looking at how do we bring more technology and better information and more fidelity of the data that we have to help underwriting and claims management, <clears throat> a 100-year model is changing. In the same way, we have had paint and supplies ordered and delivered and used in the same way for 100 years. And, and it wouldn't be beyond the, the, the realm of, of fantasy to think that given modern logistics, 3PL, and the machinery and robotics that could, you know, inject itself into the mixing and the ordering and the replenishment of that, uh, that that will change dramatically. That said, there are some legal requirements and health and safety requirements as to why distribution is the way it is, uh, and they too will have to be addressed. Listen, I don't think it's a radical changing world in the next two years. I think we're going to see, in the same way as if if you'd have polled this group at the start of 2019 and said, hey, do you think 80% of scanning and diagnostics will be paid for and just become part of the norm within this 12 months? I don't think you'd have got a high percentage on it. And so we'll see these things as, as the shops, and I believe it starts with the shops, focus on doing the right thing every time. I think we'll see evolution of things changing rather than revolution of things changing. Um, and that will all be supported by technology. And in the paint and distribution world, um, it, it is in the same way as every other distribution method of the, of the 2020s, ripe for change. Disruption, technology will disrupt it. Uh, Sean, what are your thoughts in terms of OEs to clarify procedures as many can be vaguely written, for example, when they say, quote, may be necessary. What are some of your thoughts? 
<clears throat> yeah, so I think what, what the repair community has to first of all, you know, appreciate is that these are written by people that are engineering a vehicle. And whereas, uh, by and large, they understand that this vehicle will be damaged and does need to be repaired, they are first and foremost engineers. And so, you know, I'm an engineer by trade. Never take something apart that you couldn't for certain put back together. Always follow the steps of what you've took apart in the order of how you put it back together. Um, and follow the procedures. So sometimes they are written and coded in a way that says, well, just do what you did before. You know, just reverse this whole thing. And, and that isn't always applicable when the damage isn't necessarily related directly to stripping off and putting back on. What I'm encouraging the OEMs to do, and again, I was in front of them at the OEM roundtable last week in Palm Springs, is, is get, get these procedures out there, make them readily available, stop making it, um, well, think about how economic it is for you to have them in the marketplace as opposed to the, the way in which it's charged for, and seek feedback. Actively put some site out there that says, if you spot a procedure in any of our vehicles that could be better, please tell us. Because what I do see now is the, the integration between the sales and marketing groups and the parts and services groups uh, with the engineering groups. And there is a good deal of influence coming from the front end distribution side of the car companies, which is the sales and marketing side, uh, going back into the engineering. We shouldn't forget, there'll be, you know, on any model platform, there'll be 50 to 100 different engineers. You know, there'll be an engineer for the seat belts, an engineer for the seats, an engineer for the seat mechanisms, an engineer for the seat electronics. They don't always talk to each other. They don't always understand the implications of what it means to say, we would strongly recommend you do that, as opposed to, this is what must be done. But here's another thing. There are procedures out there that are very clear. Do this, do that. This is a one-time fit part. And they're not being adhered to now. So it cuts both ways. Both sides have got to come to the middle. Uh, but I believe the OEMs would be actively interested in hearing from you if you have a procedure that you think is ambiguous or missing or flat out wrong. Thank you, Sean. Uh, we have quite a few more questions, and I'll I'll ask one one more if we have time. But for those who weren't able to get their questions answered, um, please, is it okay if people reach out to you by email with additional questions? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've no idea how many folks are on here and how many emails I'm gonna get. Uh, I, here's my <laughs> promise, I'll get back to everybody. It may not be the answer you like, you know, I may not have an answer for it, but I will get back to everybody, just give me a little bit of time. Okay, well, thank you. So here's one more, will the, do you think the OEMs uh, will have to manufacture replacement parts for all years and models of vehicles they sold into a market? Will they have to? Is that, is that any different to what's happening now? Is, am I not understanding that question correctly? And he also you... asked, how, how can a car be repaired without part availability under the OEM procedures? It can't. Okay. Simple. Perfect. You know, I'm not, I'm not here to defend or, or identify gaps. I'm just saying, how can you repair a car without a part? If it says this part has to be fitted to the car, you can't do it. Okay. So you would um, reach out. In that instance, you'd reach out to the OEM and say, hey, you, you need to provide me with a part for this, otherwise I can't repair the vehicle. Okay. Thank you. We have one more quick one. Do you see the repair authority shifting to the OE? versus the shop, or in some cases, the carrier? I think repair authority resides between the three entities, right? And we always think about battles in this industry. We think about the fight, and, and I use the term all the time. I'm as guilty as anybody else. Uh, but we always think about the battle. And, and what the past couple of years has been certainly highlighting to me is that we don't have time for battle. We've got, we've got to work together. We've got to find a way. So repair authority, um, it, it's, it's a broad statement. But I think the repairer, if the repairer is advocating for every single customer's car, whether it's a $2,000 
14 year old car or a $60,000 12 month old car, if you're advocating for the right thing every single time, I don't know that that's the issue. I believe what might be at stake there then is who's at issue. Thank you. Ed? Thank you very much, John. I appreciate it. Um, we invite the uh, participants uh, to participate in future SICACAST broadcasts. A full schedule of future broadcasts is available on SICA.com. Uh, simply select the events tab at the top of the page. Our next SICACAST will be Friday, February 13, starting at 11 a.m. Central Time. Mike Anderson, president and owner of Collision Advice, will discuss the importance of utilizing technology in the collision repair industry to thrive and not just survive in 2020. SIG has partnered with the Automotive Management Institute. Attendees of this webinar can take a short quiz on the AMI website to earn credit toward a professional designation. A link to AMI and a coupon code is available on SICA.com. Please follow SICA's media platforms to stay up to date on upcoming events and SICA news. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you.